just to introduce myself, my name is Matthew Hill. I'm the editor of Coin Collector magazine and also of the allaboutcoins.co.uk website. Um, we're really lucky today to be joined by uh, Chris Barker, who's the Information Research Manager at the Royal Mint Museum. Um, so Chris is going to tell us um, about some of the treasures held at the Royal Mint Museum uh, in Cardiff. We'll also have the opportunity to ask Chris questions. So if you've got any questions at all, um, do just put them in the Q&A box. Uh, there's also a chat box. I mean, you can use that if you like, um, but the Q&A is probably easier for me to just manage those questions and then we'll put them to Chris at the end. So feel free to, to just type those in. And um, the digital stage is yours, Chris. So I'll hand over to you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. I'll just move this out of the way, down there. Um, Good evening, everyone. And so welcome to this talk I'm giving tonight about sort of the highlights of the Royal Mint Museum's collection. Uh, like Matt said, I would encourage any of you to, to come up with any questions at all you, you might have at the end, end of this talk. And the way I've structured it is, is quite probably idiosyncratic. It's highlights that are highlights to me as well as much as anything else. So it, the aim of tonight is to try and give you an idea of the diversity of what we've got in the collection as well. Uh, so we'll cover quite a lot of ground, hopefully. And some of this may be familiar to some of you, but hopefully there'll be new content for everybody here. So forgive me if I go over stories that some of you may already be familiar with. But I can't really start tonight without mentioning this particular coin, uh, because this is where it all begins for us as a, music, as a mint, rather. So we date our founding back to the reign of Alfred the Great, and we have no documentary evidence with which to get that date. So instead, we have to use the coinage evidence itself. And this is what we use here. This is this Londonia monogram penny of Alfred. And you can clearly see on the far side, on the on the head side, you've got a depiction there of Alfred in sort of a Roman emperor-esque style almost, with the split inscription, Alfred, running across the top. And then from the history of the mint's point of view, the more interesting thing is this Londonia monogram that's on the reverse. So we can see the L, we can see the O in the middle, then the N goes across the coin itself, the D on the far side, the I inside the D, and there's a connection at the downstrokes of the L and the N, which gives you the A. So it spells out Londonia and demonstrates uh, that this particular coin was struck in London. And the reason why I've included this in the highlights page is because of it being our sort of symbolic start date. So with all the, the work that goes on in the 880s in London, tied in with Alfred, that is when the raw mint really sort of kicks off and begins, to be honest. We can't say hand and heart exactly when. Some of you may well be familiar with the concept of the 886 date that's often um, bandied around quite a bit, um, but that sort of does tie back to slightly older evidence. Whereas today, the more contemporary thinking is that these coins came in roughly around 880 itself, although we can't say hand and heart exactly for sure. But from the late 9th century onwards, you definitely have a continuous organization that we today know as the Royal Mint. And so from the start of our highlights reel, I think this is where we really have to begin. But in terms of other things that we've got in the collection, we've got some great and spectacular rarities. And that's mostly what I'll be focusing on a lot tonight, really, and trying to bring out some of the stories behind some of these rarities and some of the stories that these rarities help to tell. One of those has to be the Henry the Seventh Sovereign. So we're very lucky in the museum that we actually have a very good example, albeit one with a rather nasty crack, as you can see, running a rather unfortunate position on the obverse. That said, it's very well struck, generally speaking, particularly for the period for, it, for its time. And with the Henry the Seventh Sovereign, which is what we have on screen here, what you're seeing is the first pound piece, so the first 20 shilling piece. And from a, from a, you know, a museum highlight point of view, it's a great thing to show to people to demonstrate how coinage and how gold coinage in particular can be read and can be used as a political message. Excellent for that, because what you see on the obverse is you see this very, very powerful depiction of Henry uh, the seventh, we see him here uh, on his very grand ornate throne. He's got all the paraphernalia there of royalty. He's wearing the coronation. Uh, he's wearing the coronation robes. He's got the orb. He's got the scepter, and he's got this big gold crown on. And it's designed to convey this real sense of monarchy, of royalty, and of power. And that is because of Henry's situation when these are first issues in 1489. 
You know, he's only relatively recently seized the throne from Richard at the Battle of Bosworth, and therefore he's quite shaky on that throne. And there are many people nationally and internationally that question his legitimate right to rule. So one of the means of propping up that power base is the coinage itself. And he issues the first ever pound coin, the first 20 shilling piece that we see in this gold sovereign, the largest coin ever struck in England up to that point. And that is why you have this really powerful depiction of him as ruler. And the name sovereign is that sort of final blunt instrument hammering home this message that he, Henry VII, is the rightful ruler, the rightful monarch, the rightful sovereign of England. And we know that Henry's using these things very cleverly. So he's not really issuing these for circulation as we would understand it today. These are struck in small numbers and they're being issued as gifts to visiting ambassadors from the courts of Europe. So you can imagine an ambassador coming into to Henry the Seventh court and as gifts to take back to their respective courts, they get given a couple of these things. And that's the joy of coinage in many ways. They're highly portable, but you can actually fit some very sophisticated messaging on there. And for that reason, that's what, and the, the huge rarity as well, uh, which is why this particular coin has made it onto, onto my highlights reel, really. Some of the other things to show to you is something that isn't really a highlight, but to get where we'll get to a highlight, but helps to give you an idea of how we think and how we work within the museum itself. So Henry VII's reign is interesting because you go from typical medieval portraiture of a monarch, which is what we see on the far side, which is a basically chap with curly hair and a crown. Standard medieval portrait is symbolic of royalty. It's not really designed to convey an individual per se. It could be anybody. It's just giving a royal image. Whereas Henry VII brings across more, right, more realistic concepts of portraiture, which is what we see on the far side there with this, this testoom. Now, the interesting thing about this testoon is that this was, up until a couple of years ago, the best example of a portrait testoon of Henry VII that we had in the Royal Mint Museum's collection. This testoon that we see on screen at the moment is meant to have come from Sarah Sophia Banks's collection in 1818, and she left a whole host of rarities to us, and I'll come on to her a little bit later. But it's meant to come from her, a very picky, fastidious collector, and it's meant to be this example of uh, a very good example of Henry's testoon. It's not good at all. It's actually probably been tooled. We, we suspect somebody's probably worked on this at some point. It doesn't look right. The whole thing doesn't sit well. And to be honest, there are some questions as to whether this actually is the testoon which found its way into the Royal Museum's collection in 1818, despite it having that provenance connect, attached to it. So there are those questions around this, this existing piece. And that left us with this, uh, this situation where we've always wanted a very good portrait testoon of Henry VII, because this is a key part of the portraiture story, because you're going from stylized portraiture to realistic portraiture. And it's realistic portraiture, which kicks on from this point. So we've needed this coin to fill a gap. And we were lucky that some years ago in 2017, we finally got to that point by buying this particular piece in that we see here. This is a very good portrait testoon of Henry VII. And it's you know, helpful in some ways to compare the two because you can see why we were so suspicious about the one that we had in the collection for so many years. The one you see on screen here that we bought in in 2017 bears very little resemblance in many ways to the one that we just I was just showing you. This, however, is an excellent example and it, is, it gives you an example of how we as a museum have identified a gap or identified a weakness and therefore gone out of our way to try and find something to fill that gap and to fill that weakness in the collection, particularly with something that we will use time and time and time and time and time again. Very, these are rare, you know, in good condition, the portrait testoons of Henry VII are very, very rare things to come across. And we were lucky in 2017 that a few people did actually stand aside to allow us to you know, bid for this and successfully get it. I cannot now for the life of me remember what the actual hammer, the total cost of this, but it certainly was well into the sort of, I think if I remember rightly, 40 odd thousand ish. Um, so it's a good example of how we were able to dip into our reserves. And as a museum, we are lucky that we actually have a healthy uh, reserve budget to be able to buy things such as this. 
Um, and that comes through with our relationship that we have with the raw mint, you know, working with the mint itself and having that link through to the business does enable us to, to buy goods such as this when we identify a strong need for it. But going from portraiture to talking on about some other highlights that of, of, from the coinage collection itself is talking about ones which there is no portrait. And that's what we can see up top here where you actually have no crowned portrait on. And what we can see at the top up here is uh, the coinage of the Commonwealth. Yet again, an area which I personally, the Commonwealth, the Civil War, and then later on into the Restoration and, and the whole way through Cromwell's era, I really find it personally quite fascinating. And from the reason why I picked these two pieces of Cromwell and the Commonwealth are because from, yet again, they're, they're rare pieces, they're interesting pieces, but from a storytelling point of view, you get a lot out of them. They can show you quite a lot. And it really helps to demonstrate how coins can be used as a resource to tell the story of the era in which they're from. Because at the top, you see these Commonwealth coins and there is no crowned head of state. So Charles I has just lost his head. We've just executed the king. And we now enter the first and only republic that this country ever uh, experiments with in the 1650s. And instead of a crowned head of, or a ruler of any description, the initial Commonwealth coinage is probably the most heraldic coinage that we ever see in this country. So you can see the shields on both sides. And instead of Latin, which was the sort of go-to for all inscriptions at this point, you end up with English being used on the coinage for the first time. So you can see on the obverse, you've got the Commonwealth of England on one side. And on the reverse, you've got God with us on the other side. The royalists at the time sort of do make a bit of a joke about this coinage because what they say is that you've got the Commonwealth, so the New Republic on one side, and God is on the other side, which is where we would do is they've just lost and they've just had their king beheaded. But they also make a joke about the design of these coins as well, because these shield, this sort of joint shield design that we see here with the harp and the uh, cross of St. George, they make a joke out of this as well because they say that this shield design looks like a pair of breeches. And given that the parliament that is in, in use or sort of in session at the time when this coinage comes in is referred to as the rump parliament, so the last MPs who were uh, left in parliament after it was purged of all those who wanted to keep the king and not execute him is referred to as the rump. So the royalists often say that this is a fitting coinage for the rump, given that it shows the breeches of uh, you know some trousers really so you get these little in jokes coming across with this um uh commonwealth coinage as well but yet again reading coins and looking at this sort of era contrast that with this other very rare example of what we've got in the collection for the common uh, the cromwell patterns themselves so these series of coins that tie in with when cromwell becomes lord protector so basically king in all but name you know he's swept away the parliament which has been dithering away and he's taken over control but he's refused the title of king and instead he is lord protector and then you end up with these series of pattern coins that we have of Cromwell, where you can see on the obverse, it's a wonderful portrait of him. And I'll come on to the design of that in a moment. We've got this fantastic portrait of Cromwell sort of reflecting that warts and all style that he's so famous for. And on it, you can see him very much sort of Roman emperor-esque with the laurel wreaths on, very fitting in some ways for the concept of a military dictator, a la Julius Caesar. And um, then on the reverse, and again, sort of reading into this and looking at the coins as a source, you have the, uh, the arms of the, the nation. But interestingly, in the centre, you also have Cromwell's own arms put into the centre of the English, Scottish and Irish uh, flags that we see there. And it's a crowned arms as well. Yet again, sort of retrenching back into these established traditions of showing a head of state, albeit not a ruler, or not a king rather, and also bringing back some of the iconography that people have been familiar with for centuries. And it's a return to Latin, which is interesting for someone like Cromwell, who is very Puritan, you know, wanting to sweep away all the popery, including Latin. But on these trial pieces, that, or these pattern pieces that we see here, rather, you get the return of this Latin. And so you've got this rather 
wonderful, that's just, well, wonderful is probably the wrong word, but this very fitting uh, Orwellian inscription which appears, which uh, basically, if you translate it loosely, sort of translates to peace through war, more or less. Uh, yet again, very fitting for a military dictator. But this is why I included these two here, because in terms of using coins as sources and thinking about this as source material, this is fantastic. It really sort of helps to demonstrate how coinage can bring to life and can help to illustrate and to add um, to our understanding of history just by looking at the evidence that we have from that era. And so we're very lucky that we've got some of these rare pieces in the museum's collection. I mentioned that I would come on to design. Hopefully this moves on, I can do. Oh, there we are. So, and I can't sort of talk to you tonight without about highlights without showing this, because this is probably by far and away one of my favorite uh, designs from the coinage that we have in the museum's collection. And what we're seeing here on screen is the petition crown. And this is a coin with a quite a bit of sort of um, fame attached to it, because it's by the chap called Thomas Simon, chief engraver of the Royal Mint. And the story behind Simon, yet again, a very fascinating figure, is that he's sympathetic to the parliamentarian cause. He works for parliament during the civil war. You know, he commits high treason by copying the great seal of the realm at the start of the civil war. So parliament can still pass laws after Charles has taken his great seal, the great seal, the only one that's meant to exist off to Oxford. And uh, during the Commonwealth period and during the period when Cromwell's in charge, he is also chief engraver. He becomes Cromwell's personal medalist. He's producing the new seals of the Commonwealth. So he's very, very closely associated with Cromwell and the Commonwealth. Not an envious position to be in when the restoration of the monarchy comes around. And as you can imagine, he's not the flavor of the month when Charles is returned to the throne. What happens, however, is that he uh, does retain his position as chief engraver. So he initially petitions to get it back after he loses it and he's given back to him in 1661. And he does initially produce dies for the coinage of Charles. But what happens is Charles brings in his own favourites, so his own uh, people from Holland, the Rotier family, who he'd become associated with and who had lent him money during his time in exile. And it's the Rotier family who sort of become preeminent from a uh, mint perspective, and they end up producing the coinage for the new hammered coinage when you get mechanization coming in the 1660s. And Simon's a bit miffed at this because he thinks he's a better engraver. And what has actually happened is that Rotier and Simon had been asked to produce designs for the new milled coinage, as they refer to it as. And Simon, because of pressure, at work, pressure of work at the time, working on the Great Seal and the other coinage of Charles, hadn't submitted anything. So he'd missed his opportunity, whereas the Rotiers had, and they got the gig. A year later, Simon, trying to get back into influence and trying to get back into things, produces this. One of the most beautiful coins out there. You can see on here this portrait of Charles II, which does everything a good coinage portrait should do. It's a likeness, yes, but I also feel you get a sense of the monarch himself, that sort of playboy monarch, the merry monarch, the, the sort of, um, you know, the arrogance almost seeps through from this portrait as well. And technically, it's hugely gifted because the difficult thing that you get with this, uh, this coin is this double raised edge inscription that appears on here which Simon, while showcasing his skill in terms of portraiture and design, has also showcased his technical ability by putting this double raised edge band around the actual coin itself. An absolute nightmare to do that. You know, we would struggle to do that today with the 21st century Royal Mint. So for him to be able to do it in the 17th century speaks volumes about his technical ability with uh, the coinage. And that, the clever bit of this, is that is where he has put his, his petition to the monarch to say, look, here is an example of my work. Look how good I am. Look how gifted I am. Please give me the job back of producing the coinage and get rid of those Dutch um, uh, people you've brought in and give it back to me. Doesn't work, sadly, for Simon. He's too badly tainted by association and he does die during the Great Plague of 1665. So uh, he doesn't have long to brood on his loss. But interestingly as well, he's probably one of the first people to, to play with the concept of uh, frosting or uh, on a coin, because this stippling that you can see on the cloak 
uh, of Charles that we have here, the folds of this here, is an attempt to sort of bring in a little bit of frosting in many ways. So quite a pioneer across the board and well worth people looking into in more detail. Absolutely fascinating, man. Continuing with the great rarities, just trying to keep the, the flow of things going so I don't get too bogged down. I can't leave you without talking about this. Yet again, another huge rarity that we have in the collection, which is the Vigo five guinea piece. Vigo, a point in time where you've got very, very few gold coins with Vigo on them. And it's called Vigo because of this inscription you can see below the bust of Anne down there, which clearly says Vigo and ties in with Vigo Bay. And the story behind that is that it's a provenance mark denotes the source, the bullion that went into making up this particular coin. So Vigo Bay is down sort of Spain, Portugal, that part, neck of the woods. And at the start of Anne's reign, Britain and Holland go to war with France and Spain. And what happens during that period when they're going to war is that a Spanish treasure fleet is coming back from the New World and it docks in Vigo Bay. Now, uh, George Rourke, uh, George Rook, sorry, is the admiral of an English fleet that goes in and raids this Spanish treasure fleet. So he sends a landing party ashore. They cut the boom that's uh, protecting Vigo Bay. He sails in and then he goes in and raids these ships and sinks some of them in Vigo Bay itself. You know, uh, hooray, we've had this great victory. We've captured this, this Spanish gold and silver. We take some back to England and it then goes to the Royal Mint to be turned into coins of the realm, which have Vigo on them as a bit of a propaganda message to show, look how amazing our fleet is and look how great we've just had this victory over the Spanish. It is, however, just a propaganda message because in actuality, they don't really capture much gold and silver at Vigo Bay. Um, the treasure fleet had been docked for a month by the time that George Rook uh, got there uh, in October. Um, and there was basically not a huge amount of gold and there was not a huge amount more silver on there. There was a bit of silver coin, a bit of silver bullion down in the holes, but mostly what you're dealing with is the captain's cabin, you know, the sweepings of the captain's cabins, it's tableware, it's statutory, it's jewelry. So that is what they mainly capture uh, at Vigo Bay. But the sweep, but all of that sort of is, or most of that anyway, is then shipped back to the Roman to be turned into coins of the realm. And there is a wonderful list of all the things that they capture uh, from the captain's cabins, uh, you know, held at Kew, the National Archives, where it's where the Royal Museum's records are these days. And um, I do think that the weirdest thing that they do take and, go, and that goes into the melting pot for these coins, for these uh, gold uh, guinea pieces with Vigo on, is some Spanish captain's gold earwax remover. So the idea of some Spanish captain's gold earwax remover going into what generally becomes a huge great rarity uh, I always sort of tickles me a little bit to be honest um, but the reason why the, the Vigo five guineas in particular are hugely rare is because there's not much gold captured therefore not many guineas full stop half guineas guineas uh, are made and there are even less uh, five guinea pieces made you know the, the, the largest denomination at the time uh, in active well uh, that was being made by the Royal Mint anyway and probably somewhere around the 20 to 30 mark of these are ever made. Um, it's very difficult to say on exactly how many, but it's a very limited number. And we're lucky that we have one in the museum's collection. And yet again, I've mentioned the lady already, these great rarities, the petition crown, the Vigo five guineas, uh, well, the, the, the supposed Henry VII testoon, uh, these come from Sarah Sophia Banks a lady who was collecting in the 18th and early 19th century and on her death bequeathed her the collection to the Royal Mint Museum or the, the newly established Royal Mint Museum and also the British Museum. British Museum got first dibs but they were very good and they didn't take anything they didn't already have and so we got the vast majority of it including these great rarities. So we owe her and her brother Sir Joseph Banks who facilitated the actual transition of the collection after her death in 1818, uh, we owe those two a great debt because they lay the foundation stones for the Royal Mint Museum uh, in 1818 and sort of in that early period because the museum was only established in 1816, a couple of years earlier. And these early bequests give us material that we would never be able to afford today. You know, for example, a Vigo Five Guineas auction today, you're probably going to need at least £400,000 to get one of these. So we're lucky to have had that uh, coming across to us. 
Staying with great rarities, I can't talk to you without mentioning this particular coin, which is the 1933 penny. And some of you may well have already heard of the 1933 penny because it's got a bit of popular mythology and urban legend attached to it. So in 1933, you've got a huge glut of pennies in circulation. There's absolutely no need for us at the Royal Mint to strike any. That said, there are a handful made. And the reason why you get them is because in that year, you get requests for year sets to go underneath the foundation stones of buildings. Very traditional use of coin. And the deputy master at the time, a chap called Robert Johnson, mischievously agrees to these requests, full well knowing that he would have had to strike a special number of 33 data pennies in order to achieve that, uh, you know, these, these requests that have come into him. And that is where we get the six that we 100% definitely know of. Three that go out there into the big wide world and three that go to national collections. So two to ourselves in the Royal Mint Museum and one to the British Museum when it comes to collections. And of the three that go out there into the big wide world, two go to churches in the Diocese of Ripon and one goes to the University of London, all of which find their way underneath foundation stones. Now, the magic of this coin and the reason why a lot of people have heard of it is that there are references in the Mint's records, good references, but not concrete, to maybe a couple more ever having been made. And because this is an ordinary circulating coin, you end up with this tantalizing possibility where this could, those extra few that may well have been made, might have sneaked out into people's change uh, uh, as a result of the excess number. And that is why you get people actively checking their change after, you know, prior to decimalization, looking for these coins. And of those that actually went out into the big wide world, one is thought to still be underneath foundation st a foundation stone, and that's the one at the University of London. Bear in mind, nobody's been digging it up to have a look to check whether it is still there. But of the two that went to churches, one was stolen. So a classic sort of heist tale where workmen turn up in high-vis vests on a weekend in the 1970s, I think it is, if I remember rightly, and they dig it up, and then they, they're gone by um, the Monday. And the other one, of the other church, when they find out that one has been stolen, they decide to dig it up and put it into, into storage, safe storage, and then ultimately they sell it on uh, onto the open market. So there is one, certain, well, there's actually a couple floating around the open market, but in terms of the attribution, those that go, you know, of some of them, of one of them anyway, it's uh, up there in the air as to, to where that actually comes from. Yet again, another huge highlight of the collection is the coinage of Edward VIII, because Edward VIII by far and away is the jewel of the museum's collection. This really is a highlight uh, for us in the, in, the, in the museum, because we have by far and away the most complete collection of Edward VIII uh, numismatic material, certainly official numismatic material, I should say, um, because during the reign of Edward VIII, with it being so short, no coins bearing his portrait are ever issued for circulation. So all you're left with are a series of trials, patterns, and test pieces. And the vast majority of those we have. That makes them hugely rare. But there's a great story behind the Edward VIII portrait as well. And that sort of has come to light a lot more recently, what with us having a new monarch coming to the throne for the first time in such a long time. Because it's tradition, the way the monarch faces should alternate by reign. And that is a tradition that goes way, way back to Charles II. It's a very British tradition in many ways because there's no rhyme or reason really why it starts and there's no practical reason why we've continued it, but it has become tradition and therefore we have stuck to it over the centuries. Now Edward VIII would have been the only monarch to have broken those centuries of tradition because he believed very fervently that this was his best side and he was absolutely determined to have his best side appearing on the coinage portrait. And so for that, he chucks his toys out the pram and insists to be shown facing the same way uh, as his father. And he would have had his own way, you know, he would have broken those centuries of tradition. In fact, one of the things that we have in the museum's collection up in uh, our store is a plaster model of this portrait with him facing the other way. It's the right way from a numismatic tradition point of view. Um, and I can see why he didn't want it, because he does look incredibly young. He looks about 12. Um, the Mint went to great lengths to try and get him to obey our traditions, and we even went to lengths of moving his side partings, and his side parting that we see here, 
because he knew he, we knew he had a bit of a thing about it and we moved it onto the other side of his head on the plaster model um, but he was still having none of it and so he would have broken those centuries of tradition the reason why you see two port two coins on here is because these are the shortlisted two designs for his portrait on the left hand side you have the design by william mcmillan and you can instantly see you can see you've got mcm down there at the bottom beneath uh, the neck of edward the eighth and on the right hand side you have the design by humphrey paget and you can see the little hp below there and the Roman advisory committee which decides on these things is completely split 50 50. they don't know which one to go for so they ultimately offer the choice of these two which they're split between to the king and the king unsurprisingly in my view plumps for Humphrey Paget the one on the far side here that we see and the reason why I say unsurprisingly is that actually William Macmillan's design that we see on the far side is actually better sculpturally it's much more of a likeness to the monarch than the one that Paget produces but Paget's portrait is more sympathetic it doesn't look quite so aloof or austere it's a bit softer it's a bit more um, accessible and for a monarch who's having all sorts of trouble at this point in time with the whole Wallace Simpson affair where he's uh, you know wanting to marry this American divorcee who uh, being the head of the Church of England he can't marry because she's a divorcee it's all starting to come out so he, what he, it's unsurprising that he wants a slightly softer more accessible portrait that the public can view. We forget today just how much of a constitutional crisis it is when this the abdication happens in December 1936, um, but you can see it from this little box, which yet again is another favourite of mine in the collection, even though it's not a great rarity of, of any particular description. But this is the actual box in which the coins of Edward VIII sat for about 30 years. Such was the controversy. They don't want to be seen, the mint didn't want it to be seen to be tainted by association with Edward VIII. So the coinage is bundled into this sort of shoebox sized uh, object that we see on screen. You've got the wonderful inscription that you see there, not to be opened except in the presence of two senior officers of the Royal Mint. It's then wrapped with string. The string is waxed off, which is what you can see the little blobs there to show if anyone has entered into the box. And then the box is pushed right to the back of the Deputy Master's safe. And the box by itself really just helps to emphasize just how controversial the whole abdication crisis was. A massive thing at the time. And it took 30 years before we at the Mint were felt comfortable enough to allow this material to come into the Royal Mint Museum's collection. Now that's been focused largely on coins. I want to show you some of the other things that we have in the collection that helps to give you a sense of the variety of what we have. Because we have a whole host of tooling and people forget about the tooling that we have. But the earliest tooling that we have in the museum's collection is on screen there. And that's a half groat of Edward III from the 1350s, which is currently on display at the Tower of London. We don't have an awful lot of medieval tooling, but we do have some. That being said, there's not a huge amount of medieval tooling out there, but we become incredibly strong from the 1660s onwards, because from that point onwards, it was clear that they were actively setting aside tooling as some form of reference uh, collection for artists to look back on and to draw inspiration from. And what we see on the far side is this wonderful portrait punch of Charles II, which had been produced by the Rotiers themselves. And yet again, the reason why I've included this as a highlight is because it really does demonstrate the artistic skill necessary that the engravers needed to have at this point in time. You know, somebody's actually physically engraved that by eye from that point to create that design that we see there. And it's required so much effort that even when it's chipped, as we see down here, they would have still used it. It would have been easier to use that punch and then repair the actual missing detail on the tool itself rather than to create an entire new punch. And on the far side, that's just a sort of scene setting image to give you an idea that we have thousands upon, well, tens upon tens of thousands of tools in the museum's collection, not just for the United Kingdom, but stretching around the globe, touching on the work that we have done over the years. You know, some of these tools have got fantastic stories in and of themselves. I come back to Cromwell here, but this set of dies really does have one hell of a journey. You know, it's produced by Thomas Simon. Uh, he makes this Cromwell tooling that we see here. It's 
got Cromwell on it it produces these excessively rare pieces of Cromwell uh, during the, the 1650s and this is for the crown piece it's got this wonderful crack on it which you can trace on the coins themselves but obviously when Charles II is restored he wants to sweep away all of this and get rid of it and so all of this should have been theoretically destroyed but the tools sneak their way onto the open market and they actually uh, then disappear for a while about about a century or so, well, not quite a century, but maybe 70 odd years or so later, they're actually spotted by the their master of the Royal Mint, who actively wants to bring this tooling, this Cromwell tooling, back into the Mint's care. Now, the master of the Mint at the time who spots them and buys them at auction is none other than Isaac Newton. So not only do you have Cromwell and the whole Cromwellian story attached to these tools, but we actually know that Isaac Newton himself, during his time as master of the Mint, identified these tools at auction and would have probably handled them himself as they were brought back into the Royal Mint Museum and now form part of the collection. So in terms of provenance and stories behind them, it's a fantastic story to tell and touches on so many different things, um, that, you know, so many different aspects that you could help you could bring out with these set of tools. Sort of segueing a little bit into other objects that we have in the museum and our highlights. One of them, you know, we've got a nice lead in here, really, because we've got a massive, massive set of tools that we uh, that we see at the bottom, and that is for the other Waterloo Medal. So you get a Waterloo Campaign Medal, which is what we see on the roll up there. That is the Campaign Medal, so the first official uh, Campaign Medal, as we would under understand it today, is, is produced for the Battle of Waterloo, and that is individually named which explains why the campaign medal is sat on that big old ledger, because that big old ledger lists the names of all those who fought at Waterloo and should receive a named Waterloo medal. The ledger itself, yet again, wonderful object and is currently on display in the Raw Mint experience. For those of you who want to come down to South Wales to look at it, um, but it's also digitized online. So people can search through it and see if they can find their ancestors if they know they fought at Waterloo. But the other, uh, object in the foreground is for a set of die is, is a set of dies for the other Waterloo medal and this was meant to be the big impressive commemorative medal that uh, Bernadetto Pastrucci he of um, the sovereign fame was commissioned to produce um, shortly after the Battle of Waterloo and this was meant to be a real showpiece struck in limited numbers in gold and presented to the victorious heads of state and commanders associated with the Battle of Waterloo. Now Pastrucci is a very fiery temperamental Italian very very difficult to deal with really really gifted as you can see here but a man who must have been a nightmare to manage because in the 1820s he refuses to copy another artist's work and he's basically pushed to one side and ignored but the ace up his sleeve that keeps him employed at the Royal Mint is this tooling because the treasury rather sillily in their part paid Pastrucci an awful lot of money up front to produce this tooling so he can keep playing this ace in uh, in his card deck to keep himself employed at the Royal Mint because he's burnt all his bridges there by the mid 1820s. So what he does is he spins the workout, spins the workout, spins the workout, spins the workout, and he doesn't actually deliver the tooling for this great ginormous Waterloo medal until about 30 odd years later in the 1840s, late 1840s is when he finally delivers this. And by which point all of the originally intended recipients barring the Duke of Wellington had died. So the medal is never struck, and all you're left with today is a testament to the talent and the temperament of Pastrucci are these tools that we see on screen. Wonderful things, really, that help demonstrate that uh, aspect of Pastrucci's um, ability, but also just how much of a difficult man he must have been to deal with. Now, we know he, he, when he was complaining to, people, to the various deputy masters at the Royal Mint about uh, lack of pay and lack of money, um, he went to the lengths of writing those letters in Italian, full well knowing that the deputy masters didn't read Italian. So it gives you a sense of, <laughs> of the man himself coming across by that. And that's more of a sort of a close up there, as we see of the Waterloo medal roll. Generally, you are in South Wales and the Romans experience, I definitely urge you to go and have a look at. And again, sticking with medals, um, I can't sort of not mention these because the first sort of things I saw when I came to the Royal Mint Museum in 2012 were the Olympic medals. 
So bear in mind, this is in February 2012. I have uh, just started at the Royal Mint and just started at the Royal Mint Museum. I'm pretty much, I think it's day two. I get to hold and look at the, uh, the Olympic medals. The Olympics haven't even started yet. So to actually be able to pick up and hold a gold Olympic medal was a real highlight for me personally in February 2012 you know, months before the Olympics actually began. And it was a massive program for us. You know, we had to produce, I think, something like 4,900 odd medals. And bear in mind that each medal needed to be struck 15 times in order to give the level of detail that we see on there. Um, it was one hell of a job. And they had to have a certain number of medals on standby should any events be tied. So you've got these uh, nervous security people sat there watching and waiting, having to whiz up these medals to London at a moment's notice if there was any tied events that needed uh, extra medals to be made. Um, that is a little bit of a personal highlight as well as a highlight of the collection itself. And they're yet again currently on display in the uh, Roman experience uh, uh, in South Wales. A rather random one starting to sort of uh, draw to a close and yet again just to give you an idea of just variety is this. It doesn't always have to be great rarities that we have in the museum that help highlight and showcase a story. This is a Beecham's Pills box from the 1950s. I think, why on earth am I showing you a Beecham's Pills box from the 1950s after everything else that you've already seen? You know, all the gold, all the great rarities. But the thing about this is it helps to demonstrate the sheer pervasiveness of the term guinea. So the gold guinea is the preeminent gold coin of the 18th century. Uh, in, um, and um, it, it sort of disappears from active use in the sort of 1830s, 1840s. By that sort of point, it's really disappeared from use. Despite that, Beecham's are still going to some effort to put on their advertising worth a guinea a box by the 1950s and demonstrates how this term guinea has hung around in the popular consciousness long after the actual, um, you know, coin itself has disappeared from use. And that is why we have this in the museum's collection. It just really helps to demonstrate that element of it. And I will start, to, I will draw to a close there, because I could, could go on for a long, long time with highlights of the museum's collection, because there are lots of them, and they are very idiosyncratic to whoever comes into it. Um, but I hope you've all enjoyed that to some degree. Um, feel free to fire away any questions that you may have because um, no question is a bad question and I'm always interested to hear feedback and thoughts and opinions but thank you. Thank you so much Chris that was brilliant so many treasures as we've called the, the webinar we, we were uh, definitely justified in calling it treasures there's, there's so much there um, presumably I mean are, are some of the the artifacts and the coins in the museum I mean, are they all on display or some of them? Can you go and have a sneaky look at them? So we, we welcome, I mean, a lot of them are on display. So a lot of these treasures, a lot of these highlights are actually on display in the Roman experience. So people can go to South Wales and can go to the Roman experience and see uh, these things on active display there. Um, some of them aren't on display. For example, the Beecham's Pills box. I threw that in there just because it sort of is just a bit of variety and that's just yeah. a collection. Um, but we welcome researchers. We always welcome researchers into the museum itself. Um, there's, a, there's a few hurdles that people have to jump through to get into the actual museum uh, in terms of security. But if yeah. you have a research topic or if anybody out there is wanting to conduct research into the coinage or uh, medals or tooling or whatever it might be, do please get in touch and, um, and you'll, we, you, we, we can arrange things for you to come in and look okay. at some of this material. Okay. And in terms of your... Are you, are you, your role and your colleagues role at the museum I mean what what kind of is it is an everyday kind of day for you what, what would you get getting up to the difficulty with that is that there's very rarely a, um, a, a, a sort of set day um, the my role particularly I work uh, as information research manager so my job is to manage the flow of information out from the museum to members of the public. So that is what I do in many different ways, whether that's by writing content for the website or answering inquiries or helping colleagues in, in the Royal Mint deal with copy. So I do a lot of, um, you know, advising them uh, as to numismatic accuracy and also actually helping the, the, the business itself, the Raw Mint itself, come up with uh, historic sets for sale to, to customers. So there's a, a huge variety there in, in my role. But we, we currently 
we're, we're developing a bit of a different way of working than what we have done previously. So we're trying to develop a program of events uh, so that's themed each year. This year has been a bit torpedoed by the coronation and the death of the Queen from last year. Mm. But the next big event, you know, that we're sort of working on at the moment is on the themes of coins in the sea. So that's our next big research project for all of us in the museum is to try and pull together a lot of material that ties in with Britain's maritime past and the coinage. And yet again, for anybody listening or anybody uh, on, you know, on, on today or who sees us at a later date, we, we'd welcome people getting in touch about um, any stories that they have that touch in with coins in the sea. You know, we really want to engage with the public on this. Uh, so that's that's our latest thing. And we've got a whole series of themed years coming up, uh, which will help to try and touch on different different aspects of the collection. Some of them anniversary driven, some of mm -hmm. them just because they, you know, <laughs> we find them interesting. Yeah. And hopefully the public will as well. Absolutely. And do you think when you're working on these themes uh, or on particular exhibits, do you ever uncover new stories that, that haven't, you know, kind of well, unearthed new stories or new aspects of, of the history? Yeah, and, and that's the, that's that's what always engages me. So, there's, there's, you know, every day for me is a school day. I always learn something new every day. Um, mm. And that really is what's kept me in the job for 11 years. It, it's just a continuous learning. And also the research aspect of it, I, that is something I particularly love. We're always bringing out stories, different stories. Mm. Um, a, a research strand that I've been working on at the moment is the sovereign story after the Second World War. And there's loads of things I've been looking at down in the National Archives at Kew and these documents mm. for treasury files, which are absolutely fascinating, which very few people have looked at before, which is yeah. writing up. But even down to individual levels, you know, when it came to the um, centenary of the First World War some years ago, yeah. we've got a war memorial, um, a big old oak war memorial in the museum, which lists the names of those mint employees that died. And at that time, mm -hmm. I went through, um, you know, ancestry and record offices and things, just trying to bring out a bit more of their personal history. You know, what, what were they doing? What did they do at the mint? Where mm -hmm. did they serve? And just giving that level of detail and that sort of personality back to those individuals for me yet again was fascinating and that gives personal stories real people because yeah. you've got to remember that the mint it, you know we make all these wonderful things but it's still about people as well we're about the employees that work there and still work there so uh, the people stories always drives me and make and i find them interesting yeah there's so many stories that you've, you've said tonight and i'm sure there's loads more just that show how coins can tell us so much about history and could kind of give us a window on different periods of our history. Do you think that's something that will that is continuing now and will continue in, into the future with coins? There's you know their significance. Certainly, you know, take a snapshot in time as of now at this moment in the last six to eight months, mm -hmm. the new coinage portrait of Charles uh, Charles the Third. Um, yeah. it, it does offer some insights into. In, even in small ways so Charles it caused a bit of a stink at times with some people but Charles didn't want to be Carolus you know he didn't want to have, have the Carolian era because who is Carolus what on earth does that mean but mm -hmm. if you look back on Charles I and Charles II they are Carolus on their you know from the Latin on their coinage but Charles actively wanted to be Charles he didn't want mm -hmm. that um, to reflect a more modern approach so even in that small way you're getting a sense of a shift and a change in the uh, perception and the way a monarch is coming across on the coinage. And I think that is where coins are interesting because you do, they are a vehicle still that the, the monarchy and also the government can use to put messages across, whether that's just to convey a sense of identity. So what is Britain? What does Britain mean? You know, a good coin design should theoretically capture the essence of an actual country. So you should look at a coin and say, ah, yes, that's an American coin, or yes, that's a, a British coin. Um, but even with, um, you know, looking at coins as, as, as from a political messages point of view, mm -hmm. you know, we have done the Brexit coin. Um, that yeah. was a relatively recent one that mm -hmm. marked a moment in time, a change regardless of whether you're pro or anti-Brexit, you can't argue that it wasn't significant. Mm. Um, so you've got things coming across such as that, where I think in future years, coins will, certainly at this point in time anyway, will still be held up as sources that people can use and can read. I think that is significant. 
Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And um, so just, just to reiterate, people could come along to the Royal Mint experience and see some of these treasures for themselves. Is there anything else, any other sources they can kind of find online or anything to, to find out a bit more? Yeah, I would encourage people to visit the Royal Mint Museum's website. So we have a separate website to the Royal Mint itself. So okay. there's, there's rawmint.com, which is the selling entity, but there's the, you know, search for Royal Mint Museum and you will come up with the Royal Mint Museum's website, um, which is a, because we as a museum are a separate charitable entity to the Royal Mint. So we've got our own website on there and we're, we're starting a big program of, what well, we have been doing a big program of digitization over the last years, which, which is now starting to find its way online in a meaningful way particularly when it comes to the books that we've got in the collection. So mm -hmm. the Waterloo medal roll is digitized for any researchers involved with the coinage. Look for the Royal Mint Museum, uh, the Royal Mint, sorry, annual reports, which are digitized on the museum's website. They're fascinating resources, okay. and, you know, go from uh, 1870 through to 1976 and give you a really detailed information about what was happening at the Mint in those particular years. Brilliant if you're doing research during that period and want to know anything and we're adding to that all the time you know we're, we're currently just um, looking at how can we digitize employee records that we have from the 19th century and the, and the uh, early 20th century thinking about how we can bring those online at some point in the future so do check out the museum's website because you know that's part of the structured way we'll be working in the future is we're bringing a lot more themes to this and equally yeah. uh, if anybody does know anybody in care homes or um, uh, uh, from that sector, there's a fantastic outreach that we do to care homes where we send out a museum in a box, which are designed to bring back memories. And we started this with um, the anniversary of decimalization some years ago, where it's quite literally a box where people put objects on it and the box tells you about the objects and people can handle the objects. So there's lots of coins in there, lots of things that help to spark memories, particularly for those with dementias and out dementia and Alzheimer's. And that's proved hugely successful over the last few yeah. years. You know, it really is it really worked well. So do reach out to us if you know anybody in a care home setting who would like to uh, to borrow a museum in a box uh, yeah. remembrance session that we have. That's fantastic. OK, I've just had actually one question over on YouTube. Someone's just asked how the museum acquires um, all the all the items. Presumably a lot of them are just you know, historically passed from the Royal Mint, but you did mention some of the, the pieces have been acquired yeah, it, recently. It's, it's a bit of a mix of all sorts, really. So we have um, established in 1816. And we, from there on in, we were meant to get everything from the factory. It's not always been quite as clear cut as that. Um, so we've had things from the factory and still today do get things from the factory. So we're mm -hmm. getting uh, new material on a weekly basis, uh, what we're making. But in that period, we've also had bequests such as those from Sarah Sophia Banks. I think it was about two and a half thousand coins, a lot of them very rare, uh, that came to us uh, in the early uh, 1820s from her collection. Um, and there have been other bequests, other things that have dripped into us over the years. We've also identified gaps and bought material in from auction. We do okay. have a budget to buy material in. Um, so it's, it's a mix of all sorts, really. And the collection is sort of built organically almost over time. But our key focus, really, I, sh I should have said this before, is 1660s onwards, which is when you get mechanization uh, of the coinage production process. So that's our area of expertise. Prior to that, we've got material, um, and but we would actually defer people to the British Museum for an expert view, just as they probably would um, for anything post 1660s um, that's made by the Mint. And is that just that the 1660s? Is that because that's when the Royal Mint kind of became more the production? Steps up. Yeah, it's, it's more to do with where the collection strength lies. Um, okay. So because we've got a fantastic selection tooling from that point onwards, and because the collection itself becomes very strong from the 1660s onwards, it helps to tie in with the collection itself, broadly speaking. And yeah. you've got a neat delineation with the introduction of machine struck coins in the 1660s, uh, in 1662. Um, so you've got this sort of nice dividing line that you can you can put into place. Um, yes, we have material from earlier periods, but, you know, mm. and I can certainly um, uh, talk about material from er earlier periods, but uh, if you were to ask me about the Anglo-Saxons or the Romans or the Greeks, then, you, you, you know, I mean, that part of the sea where the uh, the light uh, the fish have lights on the end of their nose in terms of my knowledge, that's <laughs> a sort of area, yeah. really. Um, but, uh, but, yeah. 
Excellent. Okay. Um, don't think we've got any more questions. That's just about brings up to the hour. So, Chris, thank you so much for your time. Pleasure. Um, do you want to just repeat the, the website address? Is it rawmintmuseum.org? Yeah, rawmintmuseum.co.uk. Mm. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, and just to mention to everyone, obviously, if you want to find out more about Coin Collector magazine um, or our website, just come to allaboutcoins.co.uk. Um, we're recording the video, as you, you're probably all aware, we'll put that on the website as well, so you can view it there. So, Chris, thanks so much for your time. Have a Pleasure. lovely rest of the evening. And um, hopefully we can do this again very soon, perhaps about one of the themes that's coming up yeah, we'll look here to. In, the, in the coming yeah, years. We'll That'd be brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks, everyone. Have a good evening. Thanks, Chris. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.